guys, my name is Rachel, and later this year I had planned to have a workshop around this idea of how to build a home practice. Given the current circumstances, I think it makes a lot of sense for me to break down some of the ideas I had for that workshop and share them with you now. Uh, as we know that most of you are probably at home trying your very best to maintain some physical activity on a day-to-day -day basis, and hopefully these uh, sort of helpful hints and tricks uh, will help you to get started practicing yoga at home on your own. So first things first, let's jump right in. When you're practicing yoga at home, you want to designate a physical space to do so. So I know that when I first started practicing yoga at home, I was living in an apartment and the only place where my mat would fit, unrolled, was right in front of my dresser in my bedroom. So for that reason, I obviously didn't keep my mat out at all times. If when you are choosing a space to practice, are able to keep your mat out, um, it's really helpful in the sense that it's a physical reminder, a sort of note to self, that at some point that day, you should try your very best to carve out a little bit of time to step onto your mat, move around a bit, breathe a bit, turn inward. So first things first, pick space. If you're not able to leave your mat out, like I mentioned earlier, an important thing would be to keep your mat in any sort of props that you might have available to you all in one spot, so that when you are ready to practice, those things are there in the same place, ready to go. Uh, something else to consider is how you are affected or how you view music in a normal class at a studio. So I think it's pretty much split down the middle. There are a good group of students that really love music. It helps them tune into the moment, tune into their body, it gets them energized and excited. And there's also a good group of students for whom music does not do that. Um, they prefer their music to be sort of just background noise, super quiet, maybe not there at all. And the reason I ask you if you prefer music is because it's something you could easily um, incorporate into a home practice or, if you don't like it, easily leave out. So if music is something, if music is your jam, then put some on while you're practicing. If you don't want to, you're in control. You certainly don't have to play music if it doesn't add to your practice. Some other thoughts for how you might get started. I know a lot of teachers and just students in general, when they step onto their mat, like to either start by reading some things, whether they're passages or poems, uh, perhaps journaling. Um, and those are just things that you could try out. If they work for you, great. Keep them, incorporate them on a daily basis. If they don't, just leave them behind. I know that sometimes when I allow myself and give myself a few extra minutes to journal before I practice, it allows me to sort of take the thoughts that are currently in my mind, get them down on the page, and then it lets me sort of put them to the side so that I'm better able to focus on the present moment um, with how I'm feeling and sort of connect better with the here and the now. So just something to consider if you want to try journaling before you start to physically move on your mat. I'm going to say this now and I'll say it again and then probably again and again. One of the most important things I want you to understand about practicing yoga at home is that it doesn't have to look any certain way. And that really is the beauty of a home practice. Um, when you think about a class that you take in a studio, um, you go from one set of postures to the next, to the next. There's like, generally speaking, um, sort of a, a specific flow or pace to the class. And it goes from one thing to the next, to the next, without too many breaks in between. Something to understand is that your home practice does not have to be that way. It doesn't have to look or feel the same as a class that you might take in a studio. So. I think one of the best parts of practicing at home is it gives you more time and a little more space to hang out in those postures and make some adjustments here and there to take the poses to a deeper place that you might not have time for in a traditional class. So feel free to slow down a bit when you're practicing at home and don't feel like you have to keep up with the same pace or cadence that a class in a studio might have. I know personally, for me, that was one of my biggest hurdles when I started to practice at home. 
I thought that what I did on my mat at home should match the flow and the pace of what I was doing in class in a studio. And that's simply not the case. And when I came to really understand that I could slow down a lot more, <laughs> a bit more, and um, just sort of explore, then that is when I really started to find the value in practicing at home. So let's start to break down a few of the physical postures that will help you to sort of dive in. And we're gonna start with seven. So sun A is, for some of you this is probably a review and for some of you it is a reminder, sun A is what most classes start with, um, most meaning if you come to a flow class at Ascend or maybe a yin yasa, it probably starts with sun A, that's mountain pose, forward fold, halfway lift, and straight to a vinyasa. So we'll review that here and then I'll break down the vinyasa. The beauty of sun A is that you could do sun A and that could be your practice for the day and that would be a beautiful practice. Um, what's important to remember is that sun A is a really foundational set of poses. So if you want to, again, this could serve as your practice. I know that when I'm practicing at home, nine out of 10 times I start with sun A because it's really just foundational. It's a nice way for me to warm up and sort of tune in with my body, connect with my breath. And then from there, I can start to see where I might wanna go next. So, sun A, we start with mountain pose, rooting down into the feet, then arms can reach up towards the sky, knit the ribs together, gaze is forward. As you exhale, it's a forward fold, hinging at your hips, reaching down towards your mat, bending into as you need, and then you're going to drop the crown of the head down towards the ground. On an inhale, it's a half foot lift. Hands can come to shins or thighs. You're squeezing the space in between your shoulder blades together, and then bringing as much length as you can into your spine. So draw the crown of the head forward, press the tailbone back, send the gaze towards the toes, and then you'll find your way into high plank. Hands plant, feet step back. So, from here, oh, that's on A. What did we just flow through? Then you add on the vinyasa. I'm going to show you three options here for a vinyasa. Don't mind if I get a little bit out of breath because all of them take a lot of effort and work. And I just want you to see the different options that you have and then take one that will work best for you. Also, an option would be to play around with all three of the variations that I show you. Um, and you can see where you'd like to, to go from there. So option number one is to come into your high plank, pull the belly button up and in towards the spine, round through the upper back, push the ground away from you actively with your hands. Take an inhale to look towards the top of your mat. And then as you exhale, it's downward facing dog, hips press up and back, and you reset. That may look like a simple option. However, if you really take your time, use your core rather than momentum to find that downward facing dog, you'll find that it does take a lot of effort. The second option, you similarly start in high plank, and then you're going to find your way into low plank. From the high plank, you can drop down onto the knees, keep your upper body stiff as a board. Again, belly button is still pulled in towards the side. Shift forward with an inhale, and as you exhale, you find a low plank or that sort of push-up position. Elbows pulled back, and then it's upward facing dog. Thighs lift up off the mat, heart pulls forward. You can micro bend the elbows and try to break even more space in between the tops of the shoulders and the earlobes. Then it's downward facing dog. Your hips go up and back. If you're trying to decide if you should take your um, high level plank from your knees, then I would encourage you to really check in with your low back. As you lower down, if you feel like you're sinking into your low back, then stay on the knees, build strength there. If as you lower down, you don't notice any sagging or discomfort through the low back, then you can try it on your toes, which is our final option here. High plank again. Again, you stay on the toes. So coming into low plank, squeezing the elbows in, hips stay in line with the shoulders. 
It's upward facing dog, gaze is forward, thighs are lifted. And then it's downward facing dog, hips go up and back. So those are your actions for your vinyasa, your high to low plank. And you'll probably incorporate several of those into your home practice if you choose to flow through your side A. Because immediately after that halfway lift, you would take your vinyasa, and then from down dog, you would look from down dog. You would look to the top of your mat, step up to the top of your mat, take a halfway lift, add on a forward fold, and then you repeat. It's mountain, forward fold, halfway lift, and your vinyasa. Again, we call that sun A, Namaskar A. You could do three to five rounds of that, maybe five to seven rounds, see how you're feeling, and then build. The next pose or sequence I'm gonna break down for you is what we would call our sun B. And sometimes sun B is as simple as just warrior one. So let's talk a little bit about warrior one. Warrior one, if you find your way there from down dog, you're just going to step one foot forward, bringing your foot down in between your hands. The back foot will drop down onto the mat. Front toes are pointing forward, back toes are at a slight angle, like 45 degrees, and then you'll rise up. Your hips are trying their very best here to be squared to the front of the mat. You're trying to sink nice and deep into the bend in the front knee so that the front knee is stacked on top of the front ankle. And then you're trying to distribute your weight into both feet, making sure you're pressing down into the pinky toe side of that back foot. Keep this back leg engaged. From here, if you feel comfortable, the hands can reach up overhead. This is warrior one. If you're taking warrior one, your option is to bring the hands straight back down to the ground, step this front foot back, and then flow through a vinyasa. The next step would be to take that same posture, stepping your left leg up. Again, just like with sun A, you could flow through that several times, building the heat, connecting breath to movement, and then go from there. The next piece after you flow through maybe your sun A and your sun B is another beauty of practicing at home, and that is that you would get to design or build your own sequence based on your wants and needs. So if that idea of building a sequence seems a little intimidating or daunting, I would say, don't worry. And an easy place to get started is by picking three to five of your favorite poses. So. Once you've selected those poses, you can find your way from one to the next, however you'd like. I think, I think something important to note or remember is that you don't have to have really beautiful or cool transitions when you're practicing at home, especially if you're just starting out. Um, just find your way from one pose to the next, however you need to. Um, and if you notice that when you're finding your way from one pose to the next, you're sort of walking around on your mat and just taking steps to make it work, that's okay. Transitions will come with time, will come with practice, maybe even with more experience. The more that you practice at home, the more comfortable you'll feel with adding in those transitions, but transitions are absolutely not necessary. Um, it's just an option, um, just an option. So, uh, if you are unsure of some of your favorite postures, you need to take some time to reflect and think about that, then I'm going to show you just an easy flow that you might want to play around with um, that includes some of our warriors. So we just broke down warrior one. And where we're going to go next is warrior two. So from warrior one, hands can reach up to the sky. To find your way into warrior two, you come up on the ball of this back foot and then open up the hips. Adjust your feet as you need to. 
You'll notice I didn't perfectly settle into my warrior two feet, so fix them up as you need. Front toes are pointing forward, back foot is parallel to the short edge of your mat, sinking into this front thigh. From here, you can tee up the arms. And now, warrior two is a pose that a lot of yogis feel comfortable with. The best thing, or one of the greatest things, about being able to practice at home and coming into this familiar posture is that you can play around in this pose, take it to a deeper place, make some adjustments that you might not normally do in class. Because it's a pose that people sort of come into, feel confident with, I encourage you to see if when you come into those poses that you're really comfortable with, can you take them to a new place? So we went from warrior one to warrior two, and then you can go straight to reverse warrior, legs stay as they are. Hands would come back down to the ground, front foot steps back, and then it's a vinyasa. So just an option if you're unsure of the sequence that you want to flow through, or if you're unsure of the poses you want to take that day, a simple little flow of the warriors, one to two to reverse, is a way to keep moving if you don't have any particular thoughts on poses you want to try in that moment. So as I mentioned earlier, what you do on your mat when you're practicing at home does not have to look or be like in any way what you do in a studio. It really is supposed to be just for you, tailored to your needs and make sure that you keep that at the front of your mind as you start to practice at home because sometimes I think when most of our experience on our mats is in a studio, it's hard to disconnect from that flow or from that idea of what a class in a studio is like. So I would encourage you to keep it at the front of your mind that what you do on your mat at home does not have to match what you do in a studio. I want to talk about props and then offer one final note before we wrap this up. So props, if you don't have them, have no fear. I kept my water bottle close by because I realized it's about the same height as a block here. So if you typically use a block in class, then you just get creative. You can use a water bottle. I'm looking over here in the studio right now. I'm seeing a watering can that looks about the same height, maybe even a stack of books. Um, do what works for you. The important thing when you're using a block or any sort of substitute for a block, I'm going to find my way to setting over here, is it's just going to bring the ground a little bit closer to you. So whatever you have that's nearby, I'm looking over there and seeing a trash can, as long as it's gonna bring the ground closer to you, then it can serve that purpose as a block. Something else to consider is lots of times we use straps in class. That one's pretty easy to find a substitute for. You could use a scarf or a bath towel, um, like a hand towel, anything. Then in the point of a strap is it allows our limbs to be a little bit longer. So anything that's going to give you a little more length, even if it's like a t-shirt or a sweatshirt that you can wrap around your foot or something like that, it would serve the same purpose. Closing thoughts and something to remember and be mindful of when you're practicing at home is that your home practice will have ebbs and flows. There will be highs and there will be lows. There will be some days when you walk onto your mat, you practice, and afterwards you feel great, you would give it you know, a two thumbs up. There are going to be days when you come into your mat and the same thing doesn't happen. Your energy is low, you're trying to balance and you're falling out, and in general you just feel like, oh, that today, like, this stinks, and that's fine. That's all part of the journey. Um, but it's something important to remember is that some days it's gonna feel really great and some days it's not going to feel as great, but don't let those not great days hold you back from making it to your mat the next day. I'd be happy to help you in any way that I can to build up your at-home practice. So let's find a way to connect, uh, whether it's uh, through social media or something else. Um, if you want any sort of feedback on like, I put these, see, I put these poses together, what do you think? Um, I want to be uh, I want to be supportive of this process for you and um, 
know that there will be those highs and those lows, there will be those growing pains, and the important thing, again, is that you always just show up for yourself day after day. Thanks.